Are you tired of managing complex workflows and managing multiple AWS services manually? Imagine being able to visualize, automate, and scale your application workflows effortlessly. In this video, we'll uncover the power of AWS Step Functions, a game-changing service that brings order to chaos, simplifies error handling, and automates tedious tasks. Whether you're building data pipelines, coordinating microservices, or creating robust approval processes, AWS Step Functions can transform the way you develop and manage your applications. Let's jump in and learn how to harness this incredible tool and take your AWS projects to the next level. Hey, if you're new around here, my name is Ryan. I'm an AWS certified solutions architect and developer, and my goal is to teach you modern serverless system design using AWS. Let's jump in. So what exactly are step functions? Step functions are serverless orchestrated workflows built on top of Lambda functions. They help to reduce the complexity of managing individual components that need to communicate with each other. They can run up to one year. It has a super cool visual workflow view in the console, and we'll take a look at that in a little bit. And step functions also have built-in retries and error handling. So some of the core concepts of step functions include states, which are just individual units of work within a step function workflow. Common states can include tasks, choice, waits, passes, succeeds and failures. And we're going to take a look at all of these today. Another core concept is a state machine. A state machine is just a collection of states that define your workflow. Another core concept is transitions. And transitions are just connections between states that define the flow of execution. Our second to last core concept is inputs and outputs. Each state can receive an input, process it, and then output it to another state. And finally, conditions. Conditions are used in choice states to branch execution paths based on data. All right, so what are some use cases for step functions? Well, some of the most common use cases are data data transformation like ETL workflows. Another common use case is for microservice coordination. It can also be used to automate IT tasks like backups, resource configuration, and compliance checks. I actually had a use case for step functions at my company where we actually use them to fetch extremely long historical data sets from IoT sensors. This is just to give you an idea of the power of step function workflows. What we're going to build today is not that complex, but it's just to illustrate to you some of the different states that are available to you when you're building step functions. We're going to start with a Lambda function that generates a random number between zero and one, and it's gonna pass that output down to some other states. All right, so let's get building and jump on into the code. Jumping into the code here, I just created this folder called CDK Deploy Step Functions. We're just gonna CD into that and init our project. CDK init app dash L TypeScript. All right, so now that we're in here, we'll just clean up the stuff that we don't need. And if you're not exactly following along, don't worry about it. I'm gonna have this repository down in the comments below. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna create our Lambda function. So in our lib directory, we're just gonna create this Lambda folder. And inside the Lambda folder, we're gonna have this random.ts file. And this is just going to be our very simple Lambda function. All it does is create a math.random, which will generate a random number between one and zero. And then we'll just return that value. All right, so now let's import that Lambda function into our stack. We'll just do const random number lambda equals a new node.js function. It's gonna take in this, we'll just call it random number lambda. And then for the function properties, we're just gonna import runtime from the lambda library. We're gonna say node.js 20. We're gonna have our entry file as lib slash lambda slash random.ts. And then handler is just gonna be called handler because here in our lambda function, we have exports.handler. Great, I prefer using the node.js function here. It does require Docker in order to build the lambda function. So just be aware of that when you go to deploy. All right, so now we're gonna start building our states. We're just gonna go const random number task is going to be equal to a new Lambda invoke. And that's gonna import from the step functions library. Again, this is gonna take in this for the context. We'll just call it random number task. And then we're gonna to point to the Lambda function of our random number Lambda that we just created here. And then our output path is gonna be equal to dollar sign dot capital P payload. This is just gonna take that random number that's generated by our Lambda function here of value, and it's gonna put it in this output path of payload, and then that's gonna be passed on to the next state that follows this. All right, so now we're gonna actually create our first of the step function states. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna create a pass state. A pass state can be used for data augmentation or for adding metadata to whatever your current state happens to be. In our case, we're just gonna add a timestamp of when the state actually begins its execution. So let's jump in and build that now. All right, so we're gonna do const add timestamp state, and that's gonna be equal to a new pass. We're gonna import that from the step functions library. We're gonna pass in this, We'll just call it add timestamp state. And you actually don't need to pass anything else into a pass state. A pass state can also be just used as a placeholder. Now in our case, so that we can add the timestamp, we're gonna pass in a couple of different things. First, we're gonna have this parameters key. And this is gonna be an object. This is basically gonna take value of the input, which is exactly what this is equal to on the output of our Lambda function. It's just going to pass it down again to value so that it continues down the step function workflow. Then we're gonna create a new key called timestamp. 
stamp. And we're gonna set that equal to dollar sign, dollar sign, dot state, dot entered time. And then the other thing we're going to do here is we're gonna create this result path. The dollar sign just means the JSON object that's getting output through the step function. So here we're just going to output an object that has value and timestamp. All right, so the next state that we're gonna build is actually called a wait state. And a wait state is exactly what it sounds like. It just waits for a specified period of time. A wait state can be used for throttling API requests or pulling for status updates from the state machine. Since the state machine can run for up to a year in time, sometimes you just wanna check periodically on where your state machine is at at any given moment. Wait states are also useful for scheduling tasks that you want to do at a set time interval after the state machine runs, like maybe sending a follow-up email or sending a notification. Ours is going to be really simple. We're just going to simply wait for five seconds and then execute the next state. So let's build that now. All right, so we're just going to set this to const wait state is equal to a new wait that we'll import from the step functions library. We're gonna plug in this, we'll just call it wait state. And then of course we have to pass in the interval that we wanna wait for. The key is just called time. We're gonna set time just equal to wait time that we're gonna import from the step functions library dot duration. And then into duration, we're gonna plug in just the duration object from the CDK lib dot seconds and then five. All right, so we're almost finished with this here. The last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna build a choice state. Now a choice state just executes conditional logic and then we'll branch the state machine out to different execution paths based on the data that it receives. So in our case, we're just gonna set up a conditional. We're gonna check to see if the number is between zero and 0.3. And if it is, we're just going to fail the state machine into a fail state, which we'll create as well. The next conditional will check if it's between 0.3 and 0.6. If it happens to fall between between that range, I'm actually going to have it re-trigger the Lambda function to generate a new number and then re-trigger the state machine. And if the value is between 0.7 and 0.1, we're actually gonna succeed the state machine and we're gonna pass it on to a success state, which will end the state machine's execution. So let's jump in and build all of those now. All right, so first let's just define our succeed state. Const success state is equal to new succeed that we'll import again from step functions. We'll simply pass in this. We'll just call it succeed state. And we actually don't need to pass anything else into that. Pretty simple. Next, we'll set up our fail state. We'll just call it fail state equals new fail that we'll import from step functions. Of course, we will pass in this and we'll just call it fail state. Now fail state will take in some extra parameters here. We're gonna plug in error, which we're going to say that the error is less than 0.3. And then we're gonna set cause path here, which is basically going to to JSON string the value. So it's gonna show us what the value of the number was. All right, and lastly, we're going to create our choice state. We'll call this choice state is equal to new choice from AWS step functions. We'll plug in this. We'll call this choice state. And then now that the choice state has been created, we're going to create all of the conditions of the choice state. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll set our fail state. So we'll do choice state dot when we'll import condition from step functions and we'll set it to number less than number less than is going to take our value and then the number that it needs to compare it to, which in this case is 0.3. So if it's under 0.3, then the second thing that goes into when is what happens when that evaluates to true. And in our case, this is going to trigger fail state. Before we go into our middle retrigger state, we're gonna just go ahead and define our success state now as well. Again, this will be condition dot number greater than equals. And again, that's going to take in dollar sign dot value, which is again, the value that comes from our Lambda function. And it will compare that to 0.7. And if it is greater than that, then we will trigger our succeed state. All right, and now our central state, which is going to check if it lies between 0.3 and 0.7. So here we're going to set our choice state when, we're actually gonna pass in a bigger object here, so I'll scroll that down and I'll put it on another line. We'll do condition dot and, then this will take in two conditions to evaluate the and. So we'll set the first condition, which is condition dot number greater than equals. Again, number greater than equals is going to take in value. And we're going to set this equal to 0.3 because our first one was number less than. So this will be 0.29 and under. Now anything that is 0.3 up to 0.69 in this case is going to re-trigger our Lambda function. So we'll put in our second conditional for the upper value here. Condition dot number less than value. And we'll put it as 0.7. Great. And there's our two conditionals for and, but now we have to say what happens when this evaluates to true. And in this case, we're gonna set it equal to random number task. So if this evaluates to true, it's going to trigger our original random number task, which all it does is invoke our Lambda function. Okay, so we've defined all of our states here. So now let's actually define our state machine, which again is just a collection of all of our states. So we'll set this equal to new state machine, import it from step functions. We'll plug in this, 
we'll call it state machine, and then the state machine props. So the only thing that we need to define here is the definition body, and we're gonna set that equal to definition body, and we'll import from step functions, dot from chainable. And this is going to create our chain of states. We're gonna start with our first state, which is of course our random number task that triggers our random number lambda. We'll then do dot next. After our random number lambda, we're going to trigger our add timestamp state, dot next. We will then trigger our wait state, dot next. And finally, we'll trigger our choice state. Great, all right, so we've defined our state machine. If you guys are getting value from this, please don't forget to like the video, and then please let me know down in the comments if there's any other videos that you wanna see me make on this channel. All right, so now that we've done that, we can just go ahead and CDK deploy, dash dash profile cloudmancer. If you don't know what CLI profiles are, I will link my video up here that I made about the subject, where I show you how you can use different AWS CLI profiles to deploy different CDK infrastructures. All right, so let's go ahead and deploy this. It's gonna build our Lambda function with Docker. This will just take a couple seconds. Great, that finished. That took about a minute. So let's go check it out in the console now. We can start triggering our state machine. All right, so jumping into the console here in CloudFormation, we can see our CDK deploy step function stack was created. We can refresh our state machines here and we can see our state machine. Now, state machines are super cool because they give you a visual workflow. So we're gonna go right here and we're just gonna start an execution and we're gonna see what happens. When we start the execution, we can actually insert JSON here, but because our Lambda function just generates a random number, we actually don't need to do that. So we'll start the execution. And this is the coolest part about step functions is just this visual workflow. So you can actually see what's happening in your state machine. And we can see actually that it made it to the choice state and then re-triggered the random number task. And then we can see the second number we got triggered the fail state. And then we can go down here to our execution log and we can see the random number task output a 0.36. So that did end up between 0.3 and 0.7. We can see that the random number task was just triggered a second time. And we can see that we got a 0.27 this time. So that, of course, as soon as it made it through the rest of the state machine, triggered our fail state. So we can actually go here. We can see the cause has the number here and tells us what the problem was. We can just start a new execution and just see what happens this time. Oh, looks like we triggered the random number task again a second time. Okay, we got another fail state. And we can actually see that it triggered the random number task three times. And this is one of the coolest parts about step functions is you have an entire track that keeps track of your state throughout the entire execution so it's really easy to pin down where errors are happening. And then if we actually go here, we can click on the individual state and we can see what the input and the output was of the most recent execution. So here we can actually see that we had a timestamp that was added from this state on the previous execution because we can see here on the output that it only outputs the new number. But here on the timestamp state, we can see that the input does not have a timestamp, but the output does. And then let me show you why using the CDK to deploy your step functions is so much easier than it normally is. If you go here to definition, you see this big JSON file here that defines the body of the state machine. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate working with JSON and having to define a state machine template in entirely JSON is mind-numbingly boring, not to mention very tedious and error prone. So managing it with the CDK just makes a lot of sense because I'd much rather write TypeScript code. This is a pretty simple example. However, you can build pretty complex workflows that include multiple conditionals, map states, loops, all sorts of different things to do just about anything that you could want. So that about wraps up the video today, guys. If you like this, please don't forget to like the video. And then again, please let me know down in the comments if there's any other videos that you wanna see me make. Thanks for watching.